We have the great pleasure of interviewing Joyce Cusack today for the West Volusia Historical Society. Today's date is September 11th, 2023. My name is Kathy Hirsch. I will be the interviewer. Tell us about growing up around Wright Corner and what it was like. I have to tell you that uh, growing up in Deland has been a, a, a real pleasure for me in many ways. I've seen some good and, and I've seen some things that were, that were not so good, but uh, growing up in uh, around Wright's Corner, I grew up at 506 West Voorhees Avenue in Deland. We journeyed to Deland from New Smyrna Beach uh, at an early age. I went to first grade at Euclid High School and I graduated from Euclid High School in 1960. My grandma owned a restaurant called Smitty's Cafe in the Wright Building. So we would go, we lived on that same street, Voorhees, so we would, uh, it was a, a gentleman, he and his wife, that lived on Voorhees close to our home, and he worked on Voorhees at the corner of the right building, it was a grocery store in that building, and he used to ride us to the, my grandma's cafe, which was in the right building, my sister was on the back of his bicycle, and I was in the handbars of the bicycle. And he would give us a ride every morning down to the cafe for breakfast. And we would have breakfast at Smitty's Cafe, where my grandma was. Who was Smitty? Why was Her name made? was Smith. Her name was Willie Mae Smith, my grandmother. So the cafe was Smitty Cafe. Smitty's Cafe. How and many, did she serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Or was it all, all day? I, I think it may have been, I, I think it was, it must have been breakfast, and it, I, I know that it was dinner. She used to, upstairs in the right building, there was uh, rooms, a room and house. So they had a turpentine, uh, Fields, I guess you call them fields, over on 44, uh, going to war New Smyrna. So many of the men that worked in cutting the, the, I guess it was tar or something that comes from t turpentine uh, trees, and they would work there. And I think that the industry was the turpentine. They used turpentine for something. But my grandma used to f have their fixed breakfast for these men. And, and she always fixed lunch. They had a lunch box. So she fixed lunch too. So I guess she served three, three meals three times a day. I, not, I, I never thought of that. But we went there uh, for breakfast. They, and uh, then we would walk from the cafe to Euclid High School, which was on Euclid School for Colors, which was on the corner of uh, uh, Parson and Euclid. And, and that was a K through 12? That was K through 12. And I was, went first grade there. I don't remember where my sister went. She was two years older than me, so she went there too. So I guess I was, I went to the cafe probably before I started to go to school. I would spend the day at the cafe with my grandma. She walked, probably walked along to, to school. Uh, so did but, you graduate from Euclid? Then? Oh yes, in 1960. When I graduated from Euclid uh, High School, the class of 1960. And I played basketball in the Annie Jackson gym that's still on that property. Uh, I played, I was in the band there at Euclid High School. 
I uh, was a drum major. I played clarinet, first chair, mind you. Uh, so that was uh, quite a journey. And all of the, the children of color in the west side of the county, from Seville, including Benson Junction, which is now part of Enterprise, I would think, all the kids, children of color, was bused from as far as Seville and uh, right to the uh, Lake Monroe. And the kids of color uh, were bused to Euclid School That's for quite, color. That's quite a... That's a long drive, a ride on a bus. Every morning, what time did they... And, but that was for, once they got in... In seventh grade, I think they came, or seventh grade when they came to Euclid, all the surrounding areas, when they came to Euclid. Lake Helen kids came. So it's amazing they, they talked about busing to integrate, but they also bused to segregate. Uh, how many children lived in what they call Red City that walked? if their parents couldn't afford a colored taxi or a colored bus that would sometimes bring little ones from around Stetson, their parents that worked at Stetson, and uh, they would walk also to, to Euclid High School. Well, back to getting all of them here. Uh, that's when they would come at seventh grade. So many of my friends were from didn't necessarily live in the land, but they lived in the land and the surrounding community. This may seem like an obvious question, but how aware were you of segregation growing up in the land? Where was I? How aware were you of it? Did were do you were you in your own community and just stayed there, or oh, yeah. did you know that there were certain places you should go? go? What was that? We like? were self-sustaining, believe it or not. It was an area called Spring Hill, and you lived. The only time the adults went out of our community was to work, and most of them did domestic work, the women. And my, my, when we came to the land, I understand uh, I was two. My mom was born in New Smyrna also. I was the youngest. My parents were, uh, my dad was not in my life that much. He, but his, his mother was in my life. So we spent the summers in New Smyrna, in holidays in New Smyrna, with my grandmother, my dad's mother. And we spent the winters in the land with my mother and my, by my maternal grandmother, who owned the cafe. We had... Uh, Wright's Corner was self-sustaining. Spring Hill was self-sustaining. You had your grocery stores. Uh, you had your churches. You had um, all, you had your beauty shops there. You had your doctor office in the Wright Building. It was also Dr. Poole's office was upstairs. You had uh, people that had rooming. Houses, there's lots of folk lived in the vicinity of Florida Avenue and so west of Tavori's and Ambori's and up until most of them at the end of uh, Stone Street. That's where and then going to then you would go south south to Euclid School that way. So all of the all of the it was self sustaining. You had everything you needed within that community. You were not welcome downtown, and so we didn't go. 
downtown until we decide to go downtown to take it. We could go downtown and shop in the Five and Dime, which was Woodworth and McCorris. You could go and shop all day, but you couldn't have a you couldn't have a, a drink. Or if you were able to get a drink, you would have to go outside to drink it. You could go. To, there was an area that you could go to that you could sit in. I mean, you could sit. You could order a Coke, but you go outside to, to drink it. I don't care if there was no one sitting in the lunchroom area. You still couldn't sit there. What made you decide <laughs> to go and sit in downtown yeah. in Woolworths and McCrory's? Tell us well, about that. You know, when you see an injustice, for a long time, you may not say anything, but you think there's something wrong with this picture. Something is wrong with it. So I'm not welcome there. And, and my classmates, who many of them had to walk, they didn't walk through. Most of them go right down Woodland to go home from, from Euclid to Woodland. They went from Euclid probably over to Amelia and went down that way, went north on, on Amelia. So they avoided the main street. Right, they avoided Woodland. And what and so we were down, was that fear based on? Were there well, incidents? I'm sure there were incidents that you direct your point of least resistance. If you're not, don't feel that you can, if you saw them, someone on the street, you probably would have to move, let them pass. And so I guess it is an avoid. And then when you went down town to shop in Woolworth and McCorris, you, you would shop there. It always felt uncomfortable to me to sh go anywhere where I was treated different from other people that were not of my color. Can you recall any experiences that you had where that was obvious? Oh yes, they had colored and white water in J.C. Penney's. The fountain colored white. And J.C. Penney's was where Tabor's is today. That used to be a J.C. Penney store. You can shop in there, which, and you have to drink water from the colored water fountain. So well, many times we have used to go there. Let's see how this white water tastes. <laughs> and take get away from there. That's what they would say. You can't. So we would just run, laugh and run on out, identifying in a small way the injustices that were prevailing. So uh, those are the kind of subtle things. So finally we said, let's just, you know, this is not right. They were having uh, demonstrations all over the country, but not in Florida. Uh, maybe they had had one in Florida, I'm not sure, but, but I think we were the first one. Our, our class was the first one in Florida to have the lunchroom kind of demonstration. So we decided that one day we, on campus, you know, the spring of the year and the kids get kind of uh, wild and thinking of things to do. And so let's just, you know, why is it that we can't sit down in Woodward? Let's uh, go down there and shop, but we can't have a seat. Can't have a, a, a drink. Let's just go down there and take a seat. Some of us, you remember, didn't even have any money to buy a drink. <laughs> but we didn't even think that they would get that far anyway. But there were some adults that were teachers would give some of them uh, a quarter, whatever it was, that it would take to. I don't think I had any money. They probably gave me some because I was always kind of talking to uh, to have it in case they would offer, they would abide 
uh, oblige us by giving us some, some water, I mean, a, a Coke. So we went downtown, I said, let's go downtown. And so our first day, it was the talk of the town. All of, it was the mumbling of, this, of the city of the land. What was the reaction? The color, the colors. The, of the shopkeepers when yeah. you were Oh, you were they walking, could not right? believe that. They could not believe it. They could not believe that. What are you all doing? So we just went and just took a seat. And, and, and I remember particularly the waitresses in the, in, at the counters. They, they were flabbergasted. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> And, and so they, uh, we sit down, we, every seat was taken, and the ones that couldn't get a seat were standing. And I, and I think if many of the girls were seated, were seated. some of the, the, the guys were. They so it was a pretty large group that went? Yeah, it was a pretty good group. Of, I would say it was maybe 20. And then, that first, and then they closed the counter. And so we said, well, let's just go across the street. We went to Woolworths first. Let's go across the street to McCory. I can remember they had a long counter there. The counter was about as long as this. It seems like it was. And we took a seat over there. And were there some white people there when you arrived at the lunch counter? I don't remember. I don't remember if any of who was there. I don't remember if they were white folk. Were you scared? Yes, we were scared. Just scared. And then your back is turned to these people behind you. Let me get to them. Let me get to them. But the police was between us. Police came pretty quick, too. They came right away. I don't know if they saw us gathering a walker coming that route. And uh, we were at the counter, some were standing, and behind us was the police, and behind the police was folk wanting to get to us. And they, the police was the barrier. Was anyone arrested? No. No one was arrested, very orderly, we didn't say a word. And if they call your name, if they call, what's your name? You say, I'm Mary McLeod Bethune. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm Shirley Chisholm. <laughs> Did the white people know who that was? No, I don't know. That. Probably not. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Probably not, but we... I call, we, I call all, I'm so doing the truth. <laughs> all of us had, uh, uh, nobody, nobody used your name, you didn't use your name. And uh, we just laughed and went on over to the next place. Same thing over there. And no one, I didn't remember them wanting to interview us either. But I do remember that my grandma said that Joyce, don't go back down there. So after we got, after we went to both places and both, and both counters were, were closed, we walked to where the, uh, the, the county building is today. It used to be the band shell. Do you know where that, but you, you don't know where that was. Uh, that's, we, that's where we would disperse. Cause we had to go all over town, you see to get back to our residence, the ones that lived over in what we used to call Red City, which is over by Stetson. The one lived in the area where I live. Some lived in a place called Yamasee, some lived in Dunspot, and all over the area where black folk residents were. So, so, so we were dispersed, dispersed and went home. And went home. Your separate homes Your separate after home. that. Mm -hmm. Were you followed? No, no one. They, no one, I don't remember if they were following us or not. They didn't say anything to us. Me and I remember one of my girlfriends that were, we were walking, who we were neighbors, so we were walking together. And we, and we went uh, from there to, to uh, Florida, 
to Valerie's. And we were pretty close. See, I was pretty close. I lived in the inner city, which was around the Wright's Corner area. It also was a theater there, too, that was owned by and run by a, a white woman by the name of Miss Smith was her name. And we used to go to the movie every day, every evening when we were when we were at the cafe. And it would cost a, uh, a nickel, I think, to get into the theater. And, well, that's another story. But anyway, Miss, it was a man, Mr. Joe Prince was the man's name. He was the take up the ticket. And we went every day, the same movie was showing, so in the evening, that was our entertainment. So if the, Mr. Joe would say, hey, and my grandma told us, says, just say, hey, and walk, keep walking right in. <laughs> so we, we didn't pay to go to the movie, mm -hmm. my sister and I, because it was like our second home, because we were right, right in, in, the, in the cafe with my grandma, so we would go to the movie. And, and so in this one building, in the right building on the corner, right. There was a cafe, there was a rooming house. There, there was, was a bar. A there was a little sandwich shop. Uh, and, and the store was on the, the, the store was on the corner. And upstairs, there was some stairs, and the stairs were right the, underneath the staircase. And it was in the cafe. And that was our playhouse, me and my sister's playhouse was underneath the staircase. Uh, and the upstairs was the rooming house, the rooms, and I think it was one, of, one lady, we used to call her play mama, that lived up there. She had like a little apartment up there. But I don't remember any other businesses up there but the dentist's office, Dr. Poole's office was up there. And that's what was upstairs, housing and that one restaurant. I mean, that one doctor's dentist's office. And the store, that was a grocery? It was a grocery store. It was a grocery store. And, and then they moved to that larger store where that, uh, right on the corner now, is across from the right building, is a family renew. There used to be a store right there. And it was, uh, behind that was housing, apartments. It was, it was pretty much self had insurance. They had uh, down another bar, another restaurant was over there. Upstairs apartments were over there. Then this insurance agency had a little office there. Had a barber shop. It was a beauty shop there. Then it was a bar, and on the other side, the theater, room and housing. Church? The church was on the corner. I was baptized in that church at the age of nine years old. I was the youngest one that was baptized. I think we had maybe about 12 of us were baptized after vacation Bible school. I, was a, I remember looking over to see my mom when I came up out the water, and she was crying. I said, I wonder why is she crying? I thought she would be happy. And she said, she was crying because she was so happy. She said, sometimes you cry when you're happy, too. And so, and I was little, and, and I, but I remember she, she used to cry. Let me ask you about the reaction. You. You didn't just go one day no. to sit in. No. Tell us about how long it lasted and what happened after that. Oh, well, we went every day for probably about a week. And what stopped us from going, they closed the counters. And when they closed the counters, they never reopened them until they opened them to all people. And that took, what, a week or longer? It took for us to go. No, for them to reopen it. And, oh, no, it took took long time. It took, seems to me, by the time I went away to school the first year and came back home, they were 
seemed like there was a period they took them out, the lunch counters out. And then when they reopened them, they were never segregated anymore. But this was happened over a period of time. It wasn't like it took them a week to close them, but it took them almost a lifetime to open them. I shouldn't say it didn't take a lifetime, but it took time for them to reopen them. And when they reopened them, they everyone could anyone could have a seat. How did you feel when that happened? I feel that's good. That's good. You felt like you played a part in yes. that? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, it was a significant... If we had not done that, how long would it have lasted? My children could have very well lived to be treated. They wouldn't take it. But see, you got to understand, it was always young people that would make change. Change comes to trials, and, and you have to know that if you want to change the status quo, you must be a part of that change. Maybe some folk might thought it was okay for, for me not to be able to have a, a cold drink at a lunch counter. They probably, they probably thought that was perfectly acceptable. They thought it was perfectly acceptable for, for us to have Deland High School on, on the on uh, Rich and Euclid High School, two blocks away on Euclid. You get the new books, I get the used books. How do I get, no, I get used books because somebody else's name is in the book, a new book. You used to always write your name in your book. So injustice at any level must be brought to the consciousness of man. And so that was, has always been my philosophy. You see something that needs to be changed, be an instrument of change. Is that why you got into politics? Yes. What, when did you decide to do that? Well, I want to tell you about my journey to Tallahassee as a daughter of a single mother who did domestic work when i left home to go to florida and university not only was the lunchroom kind of segregated but the taxi cabs were segregated there were black cab cabbies, and there was white cab. So I couldn't get on in the land. Spent all my life here at the age of 18. I'm going to go to the state capitol, to Florida and the university. I, my mom had made arrangements for a taxi to pick me up from our house at 506 West Forest. Took me to Ohio, downtown, to the colored bus station. I got on the back of the bus, got in and rode from the land to Highway 90, which is Tennessee, to the colored bus station in Tallahassee. I myself. Cab picked me up from that bus station and my trunk and drove me to the highest of seven hills in Tallahassee to McGuinn Hall. It was I was late going because of Donna. Donna was a good happened a good thing for me because I didn't have the money to get there, I was going to be late anyway. Because my dad was supposed to send part of the money for me to come, to go. And his money hadn't come. So my mother said, well, I'll try to get the money to you. So I was late getting there, but I went by myself. You 
when you said Donna, you're referring to Hurricane Donna. Hurricane Donna. So that pretty much coincided with your going up to school. That's right. That's right. God was always protecting me, looking out for me. But I think about when my kids went to school, it was a convoy that took my daughter the first one. I think it must have been seven of us cars taking her to Tallahassee. So once you got there, what did you study? I was in education, but I didn't stay in school. I, money was tight, and things didn't work out well. And I met this guy named Charles Cusack, and I fell in love. And he was a junior fam. He was from D-Land too, five generations. My husband, five generations of folk from D-Land. And uh, so I didn't stay in Tallahassee. I came home and went to work because I didn't have the money. Chuck stayed in school. And, and then he says he was going to quit school. He was going to get married. So he came home and he got married on the 26th of December, 1961. So many things transpired in that time that he went back to school, and he was, his dad said he, we had, we had a baby. We went back to, he went back to school. Daddy said that he wasn't keeping him in school because he wasn't doing well. He had to come home and get him a job, take care of his wife and baby. So he came home for, it took him 10 years to graduate from school. Worked the Keller cabinets. I went to work. In nursing, see, in high school, I was in something called DCT, Diversified Cooperative Training. I trained as a nurse's assistant in high school. So my background was for working had been healthcare. So I went to work at, in healthcare at the hospital. One of the first person of color to be on the board at the hospital at the, when it was fish back when Bert Fish was around, I don't know him, Bert Fish and the Groves and the hospital, that's all a, a, another. Now which hospital are we talking about here? Talking about Fish, you know where the county courthouse is today? There used to be a hospital there called Fish Hospital. It was Bert Fish, who was a wealthy uh, citrus man. So was the Wright, so was uh, Mr. Wright, the one who, he was in citrus too. That was the industry of here until the hurricanes, uh, not the hurricane, the, uh, the freezes of the 60s. And that killed the, the, the citrus industry in this area. But uh, I'm jumping around, but that, that was how I got to Tallahassee. I think it's significant in that my granddaughters just went to Florida A&M University. And that's the last of my crew. And I was so worried. And my girlfriend reminded me, remember how you got there? I said, I'm so worried. Matt, they're twins. So it's two of them. I said, but they seem like this. They, they didn't so have right. to take a colored bus. They didn't have that. to take a They went in their own car. But we was behind them. <laughs> but they didn't, and they had an apartment, money was not a problem for them. So when did you decide to, to um, go, go into, into politics? politics? Well, I was a nurse for many years. I went, I was the first, one of the first, I was the first, I guess it was another lady, person to work at Fish Hospital of Color, nurse that they ever had in this time. I was the first in many. When I went to apply for a job there, after uh, Chuck went back to school, I'm working. But my mind was always, I know the ticket to success, the ticket to success is an education. You got to have an education. If you're gonna make a difference in the world, you gotta have an education. So I, I always planned that, that was gonna happen. So I went to 
Chuck was in his last semester at Florida A&M, taking 21 hours, made 4.0. He went to the dean of the department and said, I have got to graduate. I have three hours that I got to take, and I got to graduate. I got to get home to my family. And, my, and by now, we got another baby. So we got two girls. And, well, I'm in school, too. I'm going, working at night, working two jobs, going to Daytona State. First person of color to go to Daytona. I had never been in an integrated school in my life till I went to Daytona State to take cultural diversity. That was the first course I took. They had a course on that back then? Back then. Cultural diversity at Daytona State. And it was for, guess who it was for? Police officers. Did you take classes with police took, officers? Yes. What was that like? Scott, great experience. I was always in my mind that we're not been taught in mindset that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough. Oh, I was so smart. I was so, so smart. I said, I'd be. Damn, I, I can put a whole lot of folk to shame me, how smart. But that class was first class, my first experience in an integrated session. Was that a turning point for you? That was a turning point for me because it, it was, uh, and, and the guy who taught the class was from Deland. I can't think of his name. Bibi was his name. You, you, yeah, Earl Bibi, and he was very kind, almost nurturing, and as much as he, almost like he was protecting me. I always felt that he was, he was a good person, a good man. I, I don't know what ever happened to him. I don't know if he's still alive or what, but or where he is. But he was a very good teacher. Well, he was the, he was the one that convinced me that you got a lot to offer. And so, how long was it after that that you ran for office? Well, I was. 50 some years old when I ran for office. I was at the end of my career when I ran for, for, for the legislature. I had I went into Fish Hospital and worked in the OR. I in, integrated the lunchroom counters in the hospital because nurses, me and you could work all day together. And you would go into the white dining room and I'd go in the color. I said, I'm not doing that. And there you go again. There you go again. So I was. But the supervisor, the director of nursing was smart. She said, come, let's go to lunch. She was smart. She didn't know what I was going to do or where I was going to go. She didn't even know me, but she was a good person, too. Her name was, um, uh, it'll come to me. She, she has two girls. I can. But anyway, I integrated that office. So time to go to lunch, I went into where the nurses were. <laughs> and it was, it was a smooth transition, no, no problem. This was how many years after? After the lunchroom counter demonstration? I, w I graduated, it was, I was 29 years old when I graduated from Daytona State, Daytona Commun Junior College three folk of color in my class. And uh, this was, so this was in 19, and that was my first job. That was my first job as a, grad, as a graduate nurse. So I went to nursing school, I graduated from nursing school in 19. I was 30, I, I remember I was 30 because I gave blood like two days, I was 29. Because I was going to be 30 the next day. So yeah. we're talking more than 20 years later. Yes. And you still had to integrate 
Or uh, else can at the hospital. Uh, the hospital. Yeah. It, progress takes time. Too much time. And and uh, I, I, I I know that. So I integrated that hospital. I went to work uh, for a fish hospital, and I was doing surgery with this. Uh, ENT doctor, he says, what? I've been there five years. He said, don't you want to, what, you know anyone that want to work in industry? I said, I do. I think I've learned all I need. I came from this job. It's time for me to move to another arena. So he says, he looks over his mask. He said, you? I said, yeah. So I went to work for Brunswick Cooperation as the nurse, first nurse of color to ever work in the industry in, in Volusia County. So what kind of industry was this? It was, uh, we made camouflage nets. It was government contract. See, I stayed there for 13 years. Left there and came to work for Volusia County government worked in county government as a, I ran the medical services department for County of Volusia. So now I've been in hospitals, I've been in industry, now I'm in government working as a nurse. So I thought that, you know, when I came, I think maybe it's time I should probably I, I was going to, I would have had 20 years in the state retirement system when I left, when I left county government. But I was planning to run for city commission. I think that change must come from the top. So I wanted to be in politics, but it took me a, a long time to get there. And so when I worked in county government, I diversified county government by becoming the first person of color to insist that they have a diversified and inclusion position in county government. I go in to get the tag office to get a tag, no one in there looks like me. No one. Go down to any other major departments in Volusia County government, and there's no black folk working there. No diversity. No Hispanics. And, and so, I stayed in county government until I was talking with T. Wayne Bailey. He said to me that we need to find somebody to run for the legislature. I said, well, I was secretary of this organization. I said, well, who, do, who are we looking at? In Boston Coffee Shop, they asked me to run for the Florida legislature. So they set up a meeting? At, at I was a part of the meeting. I thought that I was going there to help them decide who. Frank, uh, it was uh, T. Wayne Bailey, Mary Skodersky, uh Phil Joyner, who had been, and myself. We were trying to brainstorm to see. That's what they told me. And I, and I didn't realize this until I was doing the eulogy for T. Wayne Bailey, that he probably already had this set up. And, I, and it just hit me at that time. I said, well, I'll be there. So I had to have a QSAC meeting, long story short, to decide whether or not I was going to leave county government. At that time, you could not run for public office, couldn't even announce that you were going to run for office and, and work for Volusia County government. I changed that with legislation for, 
just for that reason. That gives good people not an opportunity to run for public office. You never know unless you try. So you're going to tell me I have to stop working just because I want to try. Well, anyway, my CUSACs gave me permission to run, which gave me 19 years in the, pub, in the retirement system, meaning I'm a year short to have 20 years. But Chuck says, Joyce, you always like politics. Long time coming, babe. He says, but I think you ought to. We'll make it. He said that God will provide for us. So we had the meeting. My two girls and my granddaughter. She was 15, my, my oldest granddaughter. She said, I tell you, Gramps, I said, go for it. The youth. I said, go for it. And with that, I'm the first legislator to ever come, be born in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, and the first person of color to ever represent this area in the legislature. So another first. Ending up leaving the legislature after two terms served, which is the eight years, leaving as the highest ranking Democrat in the Florida legislature as the leader pro tem. And so, Came home, stayed home for two years, and then I said, you know, I'm not done. I came back home and I ran, I had to change that law that says that you got to retire or resign in order to run for public office. So what did I do? I ran for the county council, not as a district, but countywide. It's 500,000 people in Volusia County that can vote. I had to be out my head. But I did it, and we won. The law was changed. You don't have to resign to run for public office. One of the first people to, to understand that and benefit from that was Lisa Lewis, who ran for the supervisor of election after we changed that policy. What other changes did you make? Well, were you I, able that to make? what we're able to make, like I, I think that is significant in as much as we have the Joyce Cusack Resource Center that help folk who need assistance in education and housing. Those are the kind of things. Until we address the needs of the least of these. We're not doing our due diligence by he who sent us this one. So that's where I, I, I did a lot of things. A lot of folk come up to me and tell me, you know, you helped me do this or you did this for me. And you, I don't even remember. All I would do is just try to do good. That's what my husband used to tell me, just try to do good. That's all that was required. When you, you mentioned to me um, when we talked the other day that when you announced that you were running, mm -hmm. you didn't get universal encouragement. Oh, no. Didn't get universal encouragement, even from folks that I thought that would be supported. I mean, oh, no, that's not. You think they're going to have a black person to to re represent this area in, in the state, it's the only person in the Florida legislature of color that did not represent a minority district. Ten percent of my district looked like me. So that's significant. So those same folk who were saying, let me get to them at Woolworths, grandchildren were saying, let me get to the polls and vote for her. That must have made you feel it was really proud. So proud. My mom was there and my sister. See, all my life I had my mom. She, she believed I could do it. 
You think, Joyce? I said, yeah, mother. I'm going to, I'm going to make this happen. She cried when I was in that, being sworn in. I had two gallery passes. I said to my children, Chuck was on the floor with me. And I said to my children, you have to go to the observation room. I said, I got two important people that have to have them two gallery passes. That's my mama and my sister. I tried to get her to come today with me just to listen. But no, but that's, that's, life's been good. And I could not have done it without the people in Volusia County. Tell us about being invited to the White House uh, with that same sister, I was talking to her, opening my mail to get this big permanent. Uh, I said, guess what? I just opened up an invitation to, says, you're cordially invited to the Christmas celebration at the White House as our honored guest, as the honored guest of President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. I said, she said, what? She said, I want to go. Because it says, for me and a guest. So my sister and I, these two little old girls born in a row house in New Smyrna on Shelton Street, journeying to Washington, D.C., to the White House, to the, to the party, Christmas party of the first black man to be president of these United States. I was also a delegate to, to the convention and signed. Uh, it had reserved seating when he was, when he was in, in, inaugurated. So uh, I've had some, life's been good. So my sister and I went to, to, the, to the Christmas party. My sister's kind of disabled and walks with a walker. So I said to her, I said to this guy, I said, you think that maybe it's somewhere elevated we can get to Pennsylvania Avenue a little bit easier than this route we had to come? He says, well, I'll take you to, Doc, to President uh, Obama's elevator once they leave. I'll come back and get you and your sister and put her in a wheelchair. We, he came back, got me and my sister, got in the president's elevator, and he pushed my sister down to us, down to Pennsylvania Avenue and hail a cab to the Hilton Hotel where we were going. I didn't have a camera, and his name was Buddy. Same as my, my, my uncle's name, pet name was Buddy. So it was, that was a, that was a highlight of To get life. to shake his hand? Got to shake his hand, got, him to sign his book. He called, his staff called my office. This is the president, of, this is the office of President Barack Obama. Uh, I'm calling for County Councilwoman Joyce Cusack. Uh, girl said she liked the master fans. <laughs> she was so excited. She said, the president's office. <laughs> It's got to you. The president can't office just go. And he said, that, where do you want the books made up? Because my friend, he asked me if I get him my book, get a book signed. So he mailed the books back to me. Yeah. What you know? was going through your mind when you shook the hand of the first black president of the United States? I was just, I, I was over. Well, I'm with emotion and just think, I never thought that I would live to see that day. I never thought. I always, I thought that it was possible, but not realistic. It will never happen. And that night that he was declared victorious in that, it was just such an emotional moment for me because all things had come to pass. 
and we were still standing. So here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Describe where we are now, if you can. Well, the more we work, seems like the more we fall behind. I have a saying that says, the faster I go, the further behind I get. I'm worried about us as a country today. We have lost the self-respect and dignity as it relates to human beings and how we must treat our fellow man. Seems like we have lost consciousness of America. When your children mean so much to me and my children mean much to you, when 90% of the citizens in Volusia County could send me Noosa County and Flag County when I first ran for the legislature, could send me to the legislature, I wonder what happened to the generation that we are raising. If they will not ever be colorblind. I, I was hoping that we would become a society where we were colorblind or that we accept each other as being okay. Why haven't we become that society? I don't know. I don't know. There, I'm not the only person who has this kind of belief and faith that things would be different. But why haven't we moved? Seemed like we were moving in a positive direction. But it seems to me like greed has taken our society in a different place. We've lost the consciousness of doing what is good and honest and caring about people. And until we many times are knocked to our feet, we don't realize how much we are alike than we are different. what Maya Angelou says. That's what she said. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, and we are unalike. That's right. That's right. If we were in the dark and you couldn't see me and I couldn't see you and we developed relationships and friendships, you can't tell me that there's a certain amount of prejudice within us all, but it's identifying and knowing those things and constantly work to change that, to make it better. We all have them, but it's identifying and not denying that they're there, but don't let them take over you and be the, the force that drives you. How would you like to be remembered? Just like Chuck said, I tried to do good. Tried to make this place better than I found it. And this is your legacy? This is my legacy. This is my legacy. I hope one day that there's a QSAC mail. Well, there won't be any QSAC mails. We have my husband's and I had girls. My husband had one brother. He had one boy. And he had a girl. And all of the Cusack men are gone. So they will have to be replaced with girls. 
And that's what we got. We were in Tallahassee with the girls, and I had all five of my grandchildren there, and all girls, not a boy in them. So, you dealt a hand and you just got to play it. Well, you told me the other day you were raised by strong women. That's right. That's right. Strong women. My mom was, she bounced her checkbook. I'm just so bad about that. My mama, she, she would work with her uh, money. She, and she didn't have that much until she could find a, a, a dime. She, I said, Mother, let it go. She, she, was, that, she was so meticulous. I'm, I'm not that way. And she told me one time that she used to hope for the day that she would have one dollar that she could spend for whatever she wanted to do. Just on her, just for her. Well, I hope that she's satisfied. I tried to do everything she ever wanted or thought she wanted. Within my power, I tried to make that happen. She was proud of me, proud of us. But I was special. I know it. Don't tell my sister that. <laughs> but I was special. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. For sharing what you have shared. So life's been good, but we still have miles to go. <laughs> <laughs>